Today is the Ubosita day, which in the monastic tradition is the day we come together to uh, listen, the monks come together to listen to the recitation of the Patimoka, the uh, rules of discipline for Buddhist monks. Uh, it's the new moon, so it's also a day for uh, Dhamma Savana, listening to the Dhamma, discussing the Dhamma. So tonight uh, I'll give you some teachings. As we know, the uh, coronavirus pandemic is still uh, rolling around the world, spreading around the world and just highlight some of the uh, changes in society and the way of life for many people. Nowadays we're in an age of global travel, communication, uh, economic growth, technological advance. So perhaps it's not for surprising for many people that uh, say a, a new disease should come out and spread around the world very quickly and affect everybody. <clears throat> and uh, who knows, but maybe the future will hold many more such changes. It's quite clear that technology is changing rapidly and that's affecting our lives as human beings. Uh, digital technology, artificial intelligence, uh, medical science, all kinds of changes happening very quickly, perhaps at an unprecedented rate if you look at world history. So as human beings that's affecting us uh, and change is always something that has the potential for being stressful. But actually it's nothing new. Um, because the Buddha pointed out a long time ago that the world is subject to change. Human, human beings are subject to change. You know, once you're born, you're subject to aging, sickness, death. Uh, the environment is subject to change. And then society and uh, the population of the world and so on is constantly changing, being affected by different factors. There's nothing new and the Buddha pointed out that's the nature of our existence and it's one of the reasons why the Buddha himself left the comfort of his home life to practice the Dhamma. Because with change we have that feeling of insecurity, we're often unsettled, maybe even afraid, anxious about the future, what may happen. So he, was, he said he was looking for something that's certain, something that will bring him a sense of inner security, peace, certainty in an ever-changing world. So that truth hasn't really ch hasn't changed. You know, the one thing that hasn't changed in the world is the fact that everything changes. So the Buddhist truths still seem very relevant and maybe even more relevant than ever in this world of fast change. Um, you know, nowadays actually the world in some respects is a lot better off than the time of the Buddha. You know, we do have all these advances in the economy, science, technology, so you know the even if we have a new pandemic like coronavirus, it's probably not very long before we develop some kind of vaccine for it. Um, the various you know, death rates in the world through disease are constantly being altered um, in favor of humans. We're constantly finding uh, antidotes and cures and ways to treat different diseases and illnesses and injuries. I've had amazing advances. Um, 
economic growth has been has meant that you know the number of people in the world actually starving and lacking the basic necessities of life is far fewer now than in the past uh, even the amount of armed conflict in the world and uh, deaths by crime and so on are on the decrease and uh, the world statistically is a more peaceful place than before but maybe mentally the minds of men and women in the world not necessarily any more peaceful than before um, which is why perhaps the Buddhist teachings have something to offer the world because the Buddha was very much interested in finding ways to understand the human experience, our experience, our life in the world and particularly the human mind, how to make this mind peaceful, how to develop the right qualities to understand the truth of the way things are so that we can be at peace within ourselves. That was the Buddha's um, angle, to use a modern word. He saw that ultimately true peace, happiness has to arise from within even though how we relate to the world on the outside and how we relate to each other is important as well. True peace has to come from ins on the inside. So we have this Buddhist path that we practice and in brief we call it the practice of dana, generosity, sila, uh, virtue or morality, and bhavana, which is often translated as meditation, but means mental cultivation. This is the Buddha's teaching and way to, that he offered people to um, take away and investigate and use to find some peace. Our teacher, Ajahn Chah, used to um, joke, he'd say, when it comes to the practice, the practice of dana, it's always easy to find people who want to practice generosity. People love to share, even though it's not always easy, but people generally like to share things. They like to f find happiness in sharing, giving, volunteering, helping each other out. But when it comes to virtuous behavior, morality, it's much harder to find people willing to commit to that. It requires more commitment, more discipline, more energy, more awareness to, to um, live in a virtuous way, even though the benefits of it are um, clear to us as human beings, we still often find it hard to commit to living in a virtuous or harmless way. And then people who are willing to practice meditation or mental cultivation, even less. It's always the smallest number. A lot of people try meditation but give up quickly because it's really uh, something that shows us the work that we have to do because as soon as you start to practice any form of meditation and uh, mental development you become aware of your own limitations shortcomings as a human being you're aware become more aware of your own mind how not very peaceful it may be um, you become aware of some of the less attractive personality traits, mental states that we experience. So many people find that quite challenging and quickly um, withdraw, give up. Another th aspect of meditation is that it requires us to not only observe ourselves but to go against some of the deeply ingrained habits we have as human beings, mental habits. We call it going against the stream. And going against the stream is a very beneficial thing to do when it's done with wisdom for a good purpose, but it's hard. 
it's easier often just to flow with the stream. And here I mean the stream of our own desires and thoughts and what you'd call in Buddhism karmic accumulations. You know, we, it's easy, the easy way is to just carry on doing what you've been doing before, even if it has been bringing you a lot of stress and suffering. We sometimes find that easier. So these are the, some of the reasons that people find meditation more challenging and sometimes it puts people off before they've even started or when they do start, they don't last very long. But what is difficult but good will bring us um, great benefit. So it is worth pers persisting with it. If you've tr started meditation, it's worth persisting with the practice. If you've never done it before, it's worth trying it out. And there's two main uh, aspects to meditation practice. The first is the development of the what we call calm or serenity, that aspect of the mind. And the other is the development of wisdom or insight. These both form part of the same Buddhist path, but they're just slightly different emphasis in the, the way you're developing your mind at any one time. Um, but in, in brief, when you're developing this sense of calm, inner calm, you're learning to quieten the mind down, bring it to a place where it's still and steady. Um, because one of our biggest forms of inner stress as human beings is just the mind that is constantly racing, caught up with mental activity, emotions, and a lot of them are more negative and bring with them a feeling, an experience of suffering. So this is often where people find, do find the very quick benefits of meditation is you're learning to calm down a bit and relax a bit and let go of some of that stress. So you're learning to quieten the mind, calm it down. The other aspect of meditation is the development of wisdom, um, which is more, th comes through developing our ability to observe the true nature of our own body and mind and then maybe also the world around us to come to a clear understanding of the way things are because we get stressed and we suffer mainly because we don't understand the way things are we get confused we think things that are to our disadvantage bring us harm bring us stress because we think in that way we often speak and act also in ways that bring us more stress so the more clarity we can have, the more understanding we have, the more we have a chance to free our mind from suffering, which is what we want. So there's these two aspects of meditation which uh, we're learning in any kind of Buddhist meditation technique. Um, learning to calm, still the mind or stop the flow, the mental flow, um, and then observe, watch, observe, and learn from our experience. It's a bit like when we were kids, one of the first things you're taught at school, well I was, and I know, I know many other kids were, is how to cross a road. We used, we used, at my school when I was a kid used to get a, a guy dressed as a clown come in and tell us how to cross the road safely. And he'd always say, stop, listen, look, and you, you look back and forth a few times, then when you're confident, you cross the road. If you're confident, there's no traffic. And meditation is a bit like that. The basic instructions are very straightforward. Learning to put attention on a meditation object, such as the breath, so that you can uh, let go of the, the mind that is racing, the, the flow of your racing thoughts, mental, uh, different mental states coming up, different emotional states coming up, just learning to let them go, calm the mind down by focusing on one thing. So learning to stop and then learning to look. Once you've quietened the mind to learn how to investigate, look at things more deeply to come to a deeper understanding. 
And it's worth bearing in mind those um, two aspects of meditation because, say, I've been practicing for many years and I still use them as a basic guideline, how to calm the mind and then how to look so that I can understand more clearly what is going on. Because that seems to be the way we can free our mind from suffering. The technical terms for this is the practice of samatha meditation and vipassana. Uh, but as Anjan Chah used to point out, you know, you're working with your one human mind. And these are two aspects of this one mind. So even though they are um, slightly different aspects of meditation, they're arising and developing together. So just like two friends, he used to say, like a couple of friends picking up a heavy piece of wood. It's the one piece of wood, but the two friends can pick it up together. And one of the beauty of the Buddhist teachings is that the Buddha pointed out and explained how different qualities, different mental states, different skills, different qualities work together uh, to achieve success in meditation, training the mind, or and you might say getting the job done. So these two aspects, calm and insight, work to support each other. They don't work against each other. When they're practiced and developed properly, they're working to support each other. And uh, of course, there are many other qualities we're developing as well in our meditation. One of the ways the Buddha talked about the development of the human mind, particularly the developing the qualities that will free us from stress and suffering, he talked about the five uh, faculties, five spiritual faculties, which are again a, a set of five different qualities or faculties that work together. So the first is satha, faith or confidence in what you're doing, in the teachings, in the practice. Second is wiriya, which means like effort, persistent effort and energy put into the practice. Um, the third is sati, mindfulness. The fourth is samadhi, that state of calm, stillness, steadiness of mind. And the last is panya, insight or wisdom. So expanding out of calm and insight, you get these five faculties which we're developing in meditation. Um, traditionally, we teach to develop the quality of calm first, but it's not the only way to do it. It's just, if things are going well, ideally, generally, it's easier to develop calm and more straightforward to develop some calm and, and continuity and steadiness of mind before you do your investigation of the truth. But you can also develop investigation of the truth, what we call vipassana, um, from the word go as well, if you wish. And many people find that this is, it suits their character. But generally we teach to develop calm first. So you develop a meditation object, such as the breath, and learning to pay attention to the feeling of the in-breath, the out-breath, using that as a focus for your mental awareness so that you can let go of everything else and just bring your mind to pay attention and settle down with the sensation of the in-breath and the out-breath. And Sometimes people get very quick results. Most people find it takes a while. But generally the aim is to do this and after a while you start to feel more relaxed, more calm in body and mind. And that's because you're putting your attention on something very uh, calming, <laughs> the breath. It's a very natural thing. We, we all breathe. We all have um, the sensation of the breath available to us. A uh, few people do have difficulties because of illness um, or you know, some physical problem, but generally we can all put attention on the breath. And it's a very simple, direct way to calm the mind down. Most people have, can find that if they do it just for a few moments already, they, they can maybe let go of a, a few stressful thoughts and sort of understand the process. What's harder is to develop a continuity of mindful awareness on the breath 
and to develop a more steady state of mind, a deeper sense of calm in body and mind. That's, that takes more practice. And so you do have to be willing to um, commit to that practice. And that's where these five uh, faculties I was just mentioning earlier help. Um, the obstacles to meditation are what we call the five hindrances, panchaniwarana. And these, the Buddha compared to like five robbers who rob, five guys who rob us of our happiness and our sense of calm and our wisdom and our, our peace of mind constantly. They're like five robbers. Sometimes one seems to be working against us. Sometimes they're all working together. And um, in brief, they're the desire, we call sensual desire, the desire for different objects of the senses. So sight, sound, taste, smell, touch. Thinking about the objects of the senses is one of the biggest hindrances and distractions to our mind. Um, ill will, negativity, irritation, frustration, aversion is a second. Dullness, sleepiness, drowsiness is a third hindrance. Um, restless agitation and worry, anxiety is a fourth. And skeptical doubt is the fifth. These are five uh, different negative qualities of mind which as soon as you start to meditate will come up. And like these five robbers, you know, you're just settling down, putting your attention on the breath and then you'll start thinking about something, maybe uh, anticipating something pleasant that you might want to have or get or experience in the future or some irritation maybe with your body, how you're feeling or some event that's just happened will come up. Uh, or you may have sleepiness, drowsiness, dullness arise or anxiety or rest, uh, doubt, uncertainty. As soon as you start to meditate, one of these hindrances will come up. And so much of our meditation, especially in the beginning, is just working to develop skillful means, skillful ways to deal with these hindrances. And then, again, it's, people often lose their patience with meditation because one or more of these hindrances is bothering them. Perhaps the most common experience people have is they sit down to meditate. Their aim is to, is to watch the breath, follow the breath, and straight away the mind gets distracted away from that feeling, the sensation of the breath, and they start thinking about something, planning something for the future, anticipating something, wanting something, or lost in some memory, it's triggered a whole lot of thinking or some worry and so they have all these thoughts rushing into the mind um, some people mistakenly think that this is because of the meditation but the more you do it the more you realize this is all going on anyway through our day through our life whether we're meditating or not but meditation is just starting to reveal what's going on mentally for us so actually that's quite a good thing. Uh, you're becoming more aware of yourself, but it takes some patience and some effort and these uh, different spiritual faculties, we need to develop them to deal with that fact that we uh, suddenly are facing a distracted state of mind, a lot of uh, thinking and often you know, uncontrollable thinking, memories popping up, daydreams, so people find that's usually their first experience when they start to meditate, all the distracted thinking. And then after a while, because they are physically still, sitting still like we are, that has a good effect. It does have a supportive effect on the mind. Physically you're still, so your mind does start to settle down. But instead of developing a state of calm, having thought a lot, battled with the distracted mind, now calming down, the next thing that happens is they start to feel drowsy. So many people will tell me and I'm sure other meditation teachers will say the same. Most people have this experience of thinking a lot 
and then falling asleep. And it's very frustrating when you practice meditation. You know, if you're always having to battle with thoughts and then battle with sleepiness, um, you might decide, yeah, you're, you're ne not getting very far with your meditation. It's, and this, this tends to be a repetitive habit as well, a repetitive experience. So you can easily feel disappointed and just want to give up because it seems impossible. But this is where you need these five spiritual faculties to support you in the practice. You need um, some faith, confidence in the teachers or in the Buddha, uh, in Ajahn Chah, in what, whoever your meditation teacher is. This helps um, because if you have some confidence in the fact that other people have done this and got benefit from it, it can be done. That starts to give you some more, boost your own confidence and, and willingness to work with your mind when it is caught into thinking a lot or falling asleep. And confidence also helps to set aside doubts, which is another huge hindrance. It's probably in the beginning it's the worst or the most difficult hindrance the most um, influential hindrance in our practice because if you're still doubting a lot, you may not even begin meditation in the first place. And uh, talking to people the other day, someone was saying, one of the problems now is, say like now we're, um, I'm talking to you through a, a, a camera going out live streaming, that's going on all over the world. Nowadays we have great technology, so we have access to so many teachers and teachings that if we're not careful, that can often stimulate a lot of doubt and uncertainty in the practice because uh, maybe you hear me say, oh, practice following the breath, and you sit down to do that, but then you've heard another teacher and another teacher, and you start comparing and doubting about the method or the teacher or yourself and so on or about the Buddha because we have so much information to process and go through nowadays that can be almost counterproductive and produce a lot of doubt so that's something we have to develop a good attitude towards is doubt skeptical doubt uncertainty about the very meditation we're practicing um, so listening to the Dhamma does help to a certain extent to give us ideas how to deal with doubt. But also we have to learn to uh, recognize doubt as doubt, as a hindrance. Um, and that's half the battle won when you are maybe procrastinating. Should I watch the breath or should I do some other form of meditation? Is this the right time to meditate? You know, maybe we feel tired or there's something else we could be doing. There'll be many forms that doubt, uncertainty take even before we've meditated or as we start to meditate. Um, so we have to be on our guard, be aware, well, this is one robber who's sneaking up and I have to be aware of him and take some evasive ac action of course, doubt can be very powerful, so sometimes you can't just drop doubt just like that when you start to meditate, but maybe you can recognize it for what it is and at least settle your mind by putting doubt in its place and say, oh, this is doubt. So like if it's doubt about the technique of meditation, you might uh, make an agreement with yourself and say, well, this is one method that I've been recommended or this is one method that I've even tried before and it seemed to work. So I'm going to pursue it. I'll make an agreement with myself to pursue this method of meditation for a period of time and give it some, a good period of time. So maybe six months is a good time. You say, I'm going to pursue the practice of breath meditation for six months, for example, once a day, twice a day, whatever and then commit to that, even though you still have doubts about it, but at least you're doing something positive and constructive with those doubts. You say, well, I, I don't know whether the breath meditation is the best one for me, but I'm gonna give it a go for a period of time, say six months. And after that, you can, you can review what you've done and you might get some more information 
and a better understanding of how that meditation technique, the breath, suits you. But all that while, you'll have to put your doubts, uncertainties to a side and just say, I don't know yet if this is the best meditation method for me, but I will try it. And in the beginning of meditation, that's often what you've got to do. You've got to be willing to take the plunge, having met a teacher or being inspired, say, reading the Buddha, Buddhist texts, the suttas, whatever. You have to take the plunge, but then give it some time before you give up too quickly or give in to the doubt. And doubt can also come up in other ways, just like, you know, time and place, so you might think, oh, I'm too tired to meditate today, but that may be just your mind throwing up excuses or doubts to trick you, or I'm too ill, or it's too late, too early. <laughs> so doubt is something that will always find a new form to come up in, to block you and hinder you in your meditation, but try and recognize doubt for what it is, and get better at having recognized doubt, it's just putting it on one side. And here I mean the more mundane kind of doubts which will stop you meditating rather than the bigger questions you might have which are quite valid like you know, is, does Nibbana exist? What is Nibbana? What is the peaceful mind? Was the Buddha enlightened? This, you know, that We may have some quite reasonable questions that we can't answer but probably the doubts that are more practically obstructive to us are just should I meditate or not? Is this the right way to do it? And so on. So rec learning to recognize doubt, put it on, on one side or at least keep it at bay by recognizing it for what it is. When you don't recognize doubt, you tend to run around in circles following it and you won't get down to meditate. You won't do the thing that you are planning to do because the doubt takes you away. As far as the other hindrances go, well, they tend to pop up one after the other. So maybe you do put your doubts aside and then you start to meditate. Maybe some anxiety comes up about the past. Things, events. The Buddha used to say, well, the good things that you're planning to do can still become a hindrance if you keep thinking about the good that you haven't done yet. So often your plans expectations, uh, thinking about the future and what you need to do and should do is a huge cause of, uh, cause of um, restless and agitated mind states. So again, be aware of that, be ready for that. And you have to develop some skillful means how to deal with, say, anxiety about the future, what might happen, what may or may not happen. Um, and like now, get get to recognize that as a hindrance, as oh, this is a anxiety about the future, say. And ask yourself, can I solve this now? And of course, much of our restlessness, anxiety about the future, we can't possibly solve because it hasn't happened yet and we don't know. <laughs> so maybe that's the answer. When you get that kind of restlessness about the future coming up, tell yourself, I can't answer this yet, I just have to accept that. And bring your mind back to the present moment, back to the breath. Sometimes it's anxiety about the past or anxiety based on past events. You know, something that you've done, you could have done better, so you keep going back and going over it. I wish I'd done that better or differently. Or maybe something unpleasant that happened in the past that you keep getting stuck on. Oh, this happened to me. Why did this happen? This shouldn't have happened. What could I have avoided it? And so on. So a bit like the future, you have to learn to recognize this anxiety or restlessness of mind, thinking about the past, and having recognized it, find some skillful way to teach yourself to set it aside so you can go back to the breath. Uh, you know, the past has already happened, so tell yourself that. Oh, I can't change what's happened in the past. It's over. Nobody can go back in time and change their past, so I have to accept that and allow your mind to go quiet at that point. So thoughts about the past, the future are a big source of our restlessness. 
But as you're meditating, you have to learn to see them as hindrances. You know, it's not the time to solve the world's problems or your problems. It's not the time to keep going over the past. It's the time to let the past and the future go and bring your mind to settle on the breath in the present. So sometimes you need some wisdom, some uh, encouragement. You think it through and then tell yourself what you have to do. Now is the time to let go. Uh, other times you just bring your mind to pay attention to the breath and be as stubborn as the mind wants to be restless. You can be as stubborn in holding on to the breath and letting go of those negative thoughts. Ajahn Chah used to say, if all else fail, fails, then just hold your breath. If your mind is just determined to be restless, anxious, keep thinking about those things over and over again, just bring it to the breath and hold the breath. And that desire for life will eventually lead you to take in a fresh in-breath, having held, hold the breath for, held the breath for a while. But do it and it will bring your mind to the present moment. It will cut through the thoughts of the future and the past because of your desire for life. So you, something to experiment with, holding your breath. Other people encourage us just to take a few deep breaths to re-establish awareness, cut off the, the restless mind. If all else fails, you can just watch the restless mind and ask yourself questions as it's going on, doing its thing. You're getting to the point where you see restlessness as restlessness, as a hindrance, rather than um, getting involved with it or reacting to it. And you might um, just watch it. You know, you're caught into a, a restless train of thought that's been going on and on for maybe many minutes as you're meditating. But eventually it will change. And if you keep bringing up mindfulness and say, well, here we are, restless again, but you're willing to keep following that patiently, watching, observing, at some point it will change. You, know, the, you won't be thinking about the same old thing forever and ever. At some point that will change. And if you keep mindfully watching that to the point where the, the stream of thought changes, it subsides, it turns to some new experience, new thing to think about. At that moment, you can teach yourself it's impermanent. And what's impermanent is not really you or who you are, it's just a state of mind. A state of mind that was running its course, it's en following its own energy for a while, and then it stops, changes. We've probably all experienced that many times before, and as we meditate, we can experience it again, but mindfully watching and letting go of restless states of mind. And of course, if you've done that mindfully a few times, you can do it again, and next time, you already know as it's starting what the outcome's likely to be, because you've seen it before. So little by little, you start to undermine the power and the attachment to the restless states of mind because you know it you know it's just an impermanent mental state that runs its course finishes and meditation tends to progress like that so it's a combination of a number of these different faculties like effort mindfulness some insight understanding the impermanent nature of a mind state all working together to give you that clear understanding of this is something I can let go of. And so you get better and quicker at letting go of things and coming back to the breath. Whether it's the doubting mind, the restless mind. And you can apply it to sleepiness as well, although that's slightly different flavour. Sleepiness tends to be um, quite overwhelming when it comes on, out of, and a lot of it is out of habit. Um, as human beings, especially nowadays, we're so addicted to technology and um, digital technology in particular, comforts as well, good food as well. <laughs> There's so many things we've become quite used to and accustomed to. All of these actually can have a, an effect on the mind that it sort of learns to use them as a crutch. Entertainments, stimulation, from uh, screens, dig digital technology, good food, socialising and so on. We, we use these things as 
a crutch so that when you take them away and just sit still to meditate, it's like when you, you have a bad leg and you're leaning on a crutch, you take the crutch away, you fall over. And falling over in meditation means you fall into sleepiness. It's easy to become drowsy. Of course, sometimes drowsiness is because we're genuinely exhausted. So you have to learn how to recognize that in meditation. And that's partly just reflecting back how many hours have I slept? What have I been doing? Maybe you've been working very hard and you're genuinely exhausted. So the Buddha did say sometimes the best thing to do with deal with sleepiness, best way to deal with it is go and have a sleep. <laughs> Not the only, it's not necessarily wrong. But then there's another kind of drowsiness which just comes through a lack of mindfulness, lack of awareness. And as the mind and body are calming down in meditation, relaxing, it's sending that message to the brain and to the mind that, oh, it's time for sleep, because it's very similar to, say, going to sleep at night. And the only way to deal with that is heighten your effort in maintaining mindful awareness as drowsiness slips into your experience. And many people notice that often the first uh, sign of drowsiness is you start to go into the dream state. So you're sitting meditation, maybe you've been thinking many thoughts previously, and now all that has run its course, so you're starting to calm down. But instead of becoming calm and still and alert in samadhi, in meditation, your mind goes into drowsiness and starts dreaming. And if you don't catch it at that point, the next thing is you actually fall asleep. So the dream state is often the first clue that the robber is there, the robber is going to steal away your awareness and put you into sleepiness. It's the first sign that the robber is there. So as soon as you're caught into the dream state, state that's the sign to um, go into some kind of, uh, you employ a skillful strategy at that point, do some, something that will put you into reverse rather than falling into the dream state. You may simply open your eyes because if your eyes are closed, it's very easy to fall asleep open your eyes, you draw in light, that can wake yourself up at that moment when you're becoming drowsy. Um, maybe you have to change the object of your meditation because the breath is a very subtle object, especially if you're meditating in the evening, say at this time, if you've been busy all day, stimulating your body and mind with all kinds of activities, then to sit down, turn your mind to the breath is quite challenging it's quite a subtle object to put your attention on. So if you are meditating on the breath and you find drowsiness is a problem, sometimes they recommend go to another object, something a little more, that requires a little more activity in the mind or just changes the direction of your mind. So chanting is one thing people do to overcome sleepiness. Um, a discursive meditation where you're thinking about a theme such as the theme of kindness or compassion, thinking about something good you've done in the past that brings up a sense of joy and brightens the mind. Another one Ajahn Chah used to say is stick a candle in front of you and focus your mind with the eyes open on that candle, the brightness of the candle to brighten your mind, wake it up. And of course, another one is to do walking meditation. Very underestimated pra practice amongst meditators. And if you're really sleepy, you'll get up and do walking meditation. These are just some pointers. There's many other techniques we can use, but when you use these techniques, the aim is to bring up mindfulness and with the the steadiness of the mind and the continuity of mindfulness, you'll find that sleepiness can be overcome if it's just drowsiness through a lack of awareness. Another problem sometimes people have is they like to be sleepy because it's comfortable. Um, so they've decided to meditate, they're sitting, maybe they've assigned a, a period of time to meditate, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour. And long before they fulfilled that period of time, the sleepiness comes on, body feels relaxed, and they start to enjoy it. 
maybe previously they had something bothering them in their mind. So sometimes when people are worried or they're angry, then they start to settle down and become sleepy. They prefer that to the anger or the worry. So they allow themselves, they actually allow themselves to indulge in being drowsy or sometimes just that state of dullness where you're half awake but not clearly alert, not, not really awake enough to contemplate anything or understand anything, but you just experience some dullness or even numbness of body and mind. And people do get into that habit and it can become a very big habit and big obstacle to meditators because they get used to just being dull, sleeping or drowsy. Uh, many monks have this problem because they meditate a lot and sometimes for long hours. So sometimes it's easier just to go into a state of dullness and sit there not really knowing much at all. So try not to do that. Try to heighten your awareness and work hard not to fall into dullness or if you're aware that you're in dullness, work hard to get out of it. As I said, sometimes people prefer it to something else. So, you know, some meditators they told me they've been very angry, but when the mind becomes dull, well, at least they get some rest from their anger. <laughs> so they turn, turn to that. It's, it's preferable to the anger and so on. So you really have to talk to yourself and see the value of heightening your awareness, even though anger is not a pleasant thing to experience. Dullness is ultimately not much use to us either. And that leads on to anger, which is the, another one of those hindrances and very common for meditators, especially in the beginning of practicing meditation, is because it, there's a lot of things to get irritated and frustrated with when you're meditating. You know, your mind, number one, the mind that doesn't do what you want. It doesn't stay with the breath. It's not peaceful. It's not bright. Maybe you get angry with yourself for falling into these other hindrances. So some people start to fall asleep and then get angry because they're falling asleep. Or some people are thinking too much, so they get angry because they're thinking too much. We have this ability to judge ourselves all the time, compare ourselves to our ideals or to other people or to how things have been before, and very easily become negative about what we're doing as we meditate. Or maybe it's more just related to past, uh, activities and things that have gone on in our day, past activities. So you remember something that brings up aversion. You know, conversations, events, memories, visual memories, uh, verbal memories and so on. That can stimulate ill will. So it's another one of the hindrances we have to learn to deal with. Um, patience a good attitude, so bringing up goodwill, being mindful enough to recognize, oh, I'm caught into ill will at this time, now is the time to turn and try and develop ill will. Even that much is quite hard. Sometimes we believe our angry state of mind so much we just don't think of anything else other than following the, the reasoning and the trains of thought associated with the ill will. But having enough awareness to stop and say, oh, this is ill will, how can I get out of this? And sometimes turning to something better, so like a more positive thought, like goodwill, kindness, tolerance can help. Sometimes learning to be patient and accept something that you find unacceptable and that is stimulating your ill will. So teaching yourself to put up with something accept it, maybe it's not as bad as you think, because often our negative experiences are made worse by our ill will. So a good example of that is you're having some pain in your knee or your back as you meditate, and that painful feeling stimulates a lot of negative thinking. Have enough awareness to see that what's taking place, what is leading to what. The painful feeling arises, then you get a negative train of thought. See if you can interrupt that process. You know, talk to yourself at that moment, say, hold on, there is the pain, but the negative thoughts are not the same as the pain. If I can let them go, return to the breath, 
my situation will improve. I still might have some pain in my leg or my back, but my attitude and my mental state will have changed. And again, this is an important insight to have when dealing with the hindrances, is that what you think about your experience, of particularly of feeling, and particularly of painful feeling, it's not the same as the feeling. To bring up mindfulness, to bring up the goodwill at that point, the patience, the tolerance, remind yourself to do that, can be a huge uh, turning point in people's meditation where they separate between the mind that is caught into a negative uh, stream of thinking, bringing it back just to the present moment, accepting the painful feeling, which you know, is part of our experience as human beings. Uh, some pain you can quickly get rid of, you just change your posture. Other pain you can't, and you just learn to change your attitude to it, towards it. But the th negative stream of thought, you might be able to let go of very quickly, if you're mindful at that point. Even the breath can be very calming as your mind turns to the breath, becomes more familiar with the breath, that in itself can calm down a very negative state of mind as you gradually forget the whatever it is that's brought up the will, ill will caused it. There's a number of ways you can deal with negative negativity, ill will, but also just recognizing it as a hindrance. And all these hindrances I've been talking about, they're all mental states that ultimately are impermanent. They're suffering for sure, we know that, but they're impermanent and they're not a being or a person, they're not a self. And this is an insight you might get through contemplation as well, through developing insight, uh, meditation, but also it can be just a basic reflection as you're experiencing hindrances going to the breath. Remind yourself, these hindrances are not really you, they're mental states caused by their own set of causes and conditions, they're a karmic uh, result of past experience of past mental states coming up again. But now you're changing the whole process, you're interrupting the process. So you're changing your karma, you're changing your mental habits. And one of the realizations is, is these mental states are not a person, not a being, not a self. Therefore you can let them go. They don't have to be in your mind. And if you can bring up more mindfulness, well, you'll let go of them all the quicker. This is where you know, the, Buddha, the Buddha's teachings are helping us to change the world, as it were, because you're changing the world from the inside out. So if you reduce your anger or let go of some of your anxiety or sleepiness, you're actually not only improving your own mental experience at that time, but you're improving for the whole world because you're reducing the world's suffering by a little bit. You reduce your anger by a little bit. You're reducing the anger in the world by a little bit, and so on. And these things are ultimately are not self. They don't belong to anybody. They're just mental states that arise, pass away due to causes and conditions. And the more we can see that, we, the more we'll understand other people are just the same. They have these same hindrances just as us. And you're kind of undermining the power of the hindrances to overwhelm you and take over your mind. The last of the hindrances is the one the Buddha said is the hardest to deal with of all. It's the, the trickiest, the slyest, the, um, the one that has the most excuses, and that is sensual desire. Because it always seems good when you're meditating and you're feeling a bit bored or restless or you've got pain in your knee, it's nice to fantasize about things you desire, pleasures, pleasures in your life, to imagine things, anticipate things. And any form of pleasure will quickly fill your mind if you let it. So it could be desire for food, sexual pleasure, desire for you know, the future, things you want in the future, material things, states of being will be to do with your job, your life, your um, relationships, who you want to be, where you want to be in the future, uh, fame and fortune, wealth, and so on. There's any number of things that 
a what we call sensual desire that can eat quickly fill the mind if we let them. And they're very powerful, can be very powerful, and they can sneak up very quickly. So many people find that, like the Buddha said, it's the last hindrance to overcome before their mind actually settles down and mindfulness is established well. And you, you might find you've been battling with doubt and restlessness and sleepiness and anger and you've sorted all that out. Now you're feeling quite calm, quite happy and positive. Your mind settled down and just then you think of something you like and it's got you. <laughs> so the most powerful thing probably is the thought of, say, sexual desire, the thought of a person you find attractive. So many meditators find this as soon as their mind becomes a little bit calm, the other hindrances have subsided, sexual desire arises and you know, the thought of your partner or a girlfriend or an imaginary person or someone from the past pops into the mind and it's very overwhelming. Ajahn Chah used to say, there's, say for a monk or a male, you know, there's nothing as overwhelming as the visual form of a female or the sound of a female, the smell of a female, the touch of a female. You know, all your senses are heightened and the anticipation, the desire is so strong. It's, um, often it's the last hindrance meditators have to deal with before they attain any kind of state of samadhi. So you obviously need techniques to deal with that. And one of the most direct techniques is simply the impermanence of all sense pleasure and desire. Whatever pleasures we get through these senses are impermanent, they're transitory. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves of that. Maybe not once, but maybe many times. That pleasure is good, I enjoy it, but then it goes. How long does it last? A few minutes, a few seconds. It's not satisfactory, it's not long lasting, it's not any ultimate kind of happiness, it's a transitory happiness. One of the reasons we use that reflection often with sense desire is because after a while of doing that, your mind experiences what we call disenchantment. It's less fascinated, it's less caught up with the objects of the senses, the more you apply that, that insight. Another one is to analyze whatever it is that you're attracted to. So in the case of the human body, if you have sexual desire, the desire for the body, the Buddha encouraged us to contemplate, um, break it down into its component parts. So we have that chant that we do regularly, the 32 parts of the body. You can bring, bring up visually the images of the different parts of the body to break up that sense of the whole. You know, when you are attracted to someone, it's the whole body you tend to be attracted to and there'll be the, the version you have in your mind of that person, the various attractive qualities and parts, the things you remember or the things you imagine. Here you're doing the opposite. You're investigating that image that you have in your mind and bringing um, the mind to contemplate the 32 parts of the body separate them out, just like you might do with a, a house. So if you look at a house, you might be attracted by that, the image of that house. Oh, it looks good, it's you know, the color, the shape, the size. But then if you start analyzing it and breaking it down, you say, well, actually a house is made of bricks and mortar and timber and tiles and roofing and this and that. And you as if you were literally building a house, you put everything in piles, the sense of the whole, the house, disappears. And that, when practiced in that way, you're starting to break down your attra attraction to say, the idea of a house. Similarly with a human being, the Buddha said, well, start separating out, separating out the parts of the body. So you put the hair on one side, the skin over there, the nails there, the teeth there, then go inside, so, you know, the different organs, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the spleen, the guts. Um, you, know, you might have to imagine this or go on the internet and look at an anatomy book or something, but just to have this sense of going deeper into the physical, visual image you have in your mind, separating them out, 
the liquids, you know, the urine, the blood, the snot, all the different parts of a human body. Go through that list, the 32 parts, visualize them, put them out on the floor, just like you put the parts, different building materials that make up a house, you put them out on the floor, do that with a human being, and you're starting to break down what the, a human being is physically. You can even take it one step further and say, well, the building blocks of these 32 parts are what we call the four elements. The earth element, the solid part, the liquid element, uh, the heat element, the temperature of the body, and the air element. Whether it's the 32 parts or the four elements, you can ask yourself questions in your mind, in your meditation, as you're dealing with sense desire. Ask yourself, you know, who owns these elements or these 32 parts? How long do they last? Do they age? They're un imperfect in that way. A human being doesn't look good forever. We get older, we get sicker. Eventually, through old age or sickness, we die. You're doing this as a way of questioning and um, investigating particular sensual desires and not just sexual desire it could be for anything else you know you're obsessed with getting a new car or a new phone or you're obsessed with food or whatever it is that grabs your mind in the way of sensual desire you can use exactly the same process analyze it break it down into its component parts contemplate its impermanence how long does that thing bring you pleasure? You know, how often, particularly nowadays, you know, with the consumer society, you get your new product, you have your new experience, and almost as soon as you have it, the satisfaction, the pleasure, the desire fades, and you're looking for something new. If you keep contemplating that, your mind wearies of sensual desire. It doesn't want to go there anymore. It starts to find more peace and happiness within itself, within the meditation. And it's possible to get to the point where all these five hindrances just disappear, become peace. The mind becomes peaceful on the breath. The five hindrances go quiet and the mind is happy within itself. And that kind of happiness is what we call Niramisa Sukha. It's happiness that's not dependent on any material object or any sense. It's just internal, the happiness of a peaceful, quiet mind. What I've described tonight might sound like quite a lot of practice and work to do, and it is. And so we practice meditation regularly. But these five hindrances are what, number one, the, what we're working with. Whether you're practicing vipassana or samatha, you call it calm or insight. These five hindrances are what, what you're dealing with every time you meditate. But the result when you do overcome them is a mind that is totally peaceful, content within itself. There's no anger, there's no desire, there's no worry, there's no sleepiness, there's no doubt. It's just peaceful within itself and ready to contemplate. So the best kind of contemplation to develop the most insight is coming out of a mind that's free from the hindrances. But the reality is often we're battling with the hindrances, then we get calm, we contemplate, and then the hindrances re-emerge, so we're battling with them again, and then we're calm, and then we contemplate a bit, and then we go back to the hindrances. It's a bit of a circle like that. But nevertheless, these are skills that you're developing in meditation, and skills are skills. After a while you get better at them, you get better at letting go of the hindrances, you get better at staying with the breath, calming your mind, you get more skilled at turning to contemplate the truth, to see the impermanent nature of your mental states or the physical form of this body and so on. So I've given you some uh, encouragement in your meditation tonight. Uh, we're coming up to the Vasa, the three months retreat soon and all Buddhists, whether monastics or laity, often take the three months range retreat as a time to really put more effort into meditation. Um, maybe make some determinations to meditate once a day, twice a day, whatever you can manage. Some people uh, 
come and live in monasteries for the whole three months retreat and obviously the monastics who live in the monasteries do that as well and it's a time you can really learn to improve your ability to understand the hindrances let them go uh, this is the skill of a meditator so I'll wish you all well with your practice. May, uh, may you find the, the calm, the insight to let go of your hindrances, to experience some of the deeper peace and happiness of the mind on the inside. Uh, and I think you'll find this very valuable in your life. So I wish you all success with that. And may the uh, blessings of the Triple Gem guide you and protect you. Amen.